every one of us that is in this carriage this morning is going to be blessed by this wonderful message of love that we are going to bring to you this morning. But before we go into the word of God, I'd like to invite you, if you may, to bow your heads with me as we invite the Lord's blessing in this very carriage this morning. Let us pray. Our loving kind Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity that we can sit at your feet. Father, we thank you that you can come into our lives this morning in a special way as you share with us from your word, Father. We are just but mere sinful mortals, Father. And it's a privilege that we can come before your throne of grace this morning. And it's a wonder that you, the creator of the entire universe, can take this time just to give your ear to us. And so, Father, we thank you for this grace and love that you have shown to us this morning. And Father, may this word that we are about to learn, may it not just be a knowledge of the truth, but may it be a transforming power that will change our lives, each and every soul that is in this cage, for eternity. So bless each and every one of us, and we ask for your Holy Spirit to come down and open our hearts and our minds spiritually, each and every soul we hear, and even those that will come in along the way. It's my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so, the word of the Lord comes to us this morning in a, in a very, very special way. Uh, and as I say that it is a message of love, but also it is a warning. I say it is a warning because the message that we are going to present to you this morning, uh, how you are going to take this very gospel that we are going to present this morning, the decision you are going to take, the decision that you are going to make pertaining this gospel will determine where you and I are going to spend eternity. And so, some of you do travel with Bibles and some of you do have Bibles on your phone and some of you do have Bibles at home. I will be reading from the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 14. In the wonderful book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. Here John the Apostle is seen sitting at the island of Patmos. And as John is sitting at the island of Patmos, what happens is that God comes to him in vision. And an angel comes to John, and an angel as he comes to John, John is taken in vision, and he sees something in vision. And as he sees this, God tells John to write these things that John is seeing. And so I catch the episode in uh, verse 6 of chapter 14. And it says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And this angel was saying in verse 7, with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. So John is seeing an angel flying in the midst of heaven. And this angel having the everlasting gospel to preach unto the people that dwell on the earth. To every nation, to every kindred, to every tongue and to every people. So each and everyone in the human race is being included in this everlasting gospel message that is being preached by this angel. So this angel is reaching every language, every race, ethnicity, whether whatever background, every human being is going to get this message. As we see, now we know that the Bible is divided into two segments. There is the Old Testament and there is the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament is derived from the original Hebrew, Hebrew language. And so it was translated from Hebrew into the English language. The New Testament is derived from the original Greek language. And so it was derived from the Greek and translated into the English language so that you and I, the common people that understand English language, can also have an opportunity to study and to understand God's word for ourselves. And so, when you look at the word angel, as it is in the Greek, John saw an angel. Did John see an angel? The word angel here in the original is angelos, which by interpretation just means a messenger or one who bears a message. So John sees someone that bears a message. As John sees someone who bears a message, this person who has the message was going into all the world, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people preaching 
the everlasting gospel to the people, every human being included, whether you are Chinese, whether you are Indian, whether you are Black, whether you are Kosa, whether you are Zulu, whether you are Shona, wherever you are, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, John sees that the everlasting gospel will reach. And so we find that this very same parallel, parallels, uh, we find them in the book of Matthew. If you go to the book of Matthew chapter 24, we find that Christ himself, more than 2,000 years ago, prophesied that this very thing that John was shown would actually happen. It says in the book of Matthew chapter 24, in verse 14, these are the ways of Jesus himself. When God in the form of a human being came to walk on this planet, this is what he said. He prophesied this more than 2,000 years ago before it happened, that it will happen. And so Christ said in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 24, this gospel and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then, only then, the end shall come. So just as John was shown in vision, a messenger preaching the gospel to every human being, including each and every race, tribe, everyone, Christ had already saw, he already saw this, and he said it in Matthew 24, that this gospel, this very same gospel, shall be preached in all the world, but it will be preached as a witness, as a witness unto all nations. Then, when each and every individual has had an opportunity to hear this wonderful good news, to hear this everlasting gospel, and make a decision, a conscious decision, in their own head, then the end shall come. So which means not one person in this period will die before they get an opportunity to hear this good news. So even if you don't go to church, even if you are not a Christian, even if you don't want to go to church, the gospel will follow you on the train because Jesus said so. Because when God said it, that settles it. God said it will be preached as a witness. A witness, it will be passing in front of your own very eyes as it is this very morning. It will be passing in front of your own very eyes as a witness unto all nations. It will be preached. So even if you don't go to church, it will follow you. Now you are probably sitting there and saying, what is this man saying? What is this everlasting gospel that he's talking about? Well, my brothers and sisters, I'll give you an answer to that. The everlasting gospel is simply the good news. And while said you and I were sinners, Christ came to die the death that you and I were supposed to die. Christ came to die the death that you and I were supposed to die. Now the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, For all have sinned, all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us come short of the glory of God. And he goes on in Romans 6 verse 23 to say, Now the wages of sin is death. Sin is a paymaster. If you save sin, your reward will be death. So as all human beings, from the time our first parents, Adam and Eve, turned their backs on God the Creator, to follow the instructions and the deceptions of the creature, we were separated from God. It says in Isaiah, our sins separated us from God. And so we were bound for destruction together with the devil and his angels. As it says in Matthew 25, that the hell and hellfire were created for the devil and his angels, not for human beings. But we, because of our choice, we separated ourselves from God. And when this happened, we were bound for destruction. And so we find the gospel in John chapter 3 and verse 16. God loves the world so much that he looks at the world and sees that the world has fallen over to sin and the world, the people are bound for destruction then God had compassion over the human race and God gave his only begotten son that he may come and die the death that you and I were supposed to die that he may come and create a way of escape 
for the human race so that you and I can have a second chance in this life. And so Christ came, one who is God, the Son of God Himself. He came to this planet in the form of a human being and He lived a life and He was delivered into the wickedness of men and He died the cruelest of death for you and me. And the Son of God suffered at Calvary. The Son of God suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Son of God drank the cup which was poured out without mixture. The cup of the wrath of God. He drank that cup for you and me so that you and I can have life. He says in the book of John 10 and verse 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. But the thief, who is the devil, cometh not but to kill, and to steal, and to destroy your life. But Christ says, I am come that they might have life. Christ came that we might have it more abundantly, he says. So, you see, I am the door by me if any man any man opens the door. If any man, he says, I am the door. If any man enter in, the invitation just as we saw in Revelation 14 and Matthew 24 is being extended to the entire human race. John 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever of the human race, whosoever it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, what you have done or where you have come from. Whosoever believeth in the Son should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the gospel, brothers and sisters. The invitation again is to whosoever. If you go to the book of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, it says, Behold, Christ himself says, I stand at the door and knock and is knocking. This morning, he's knocking at the door of your heart and he's saying, if any man, again the invitation is to the entire human race, if any man opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And brothers and sisters, we know that all things are possible with God, but there's one thing that is impossible with God. There's one thing that God cannot do, even if he wanted to, because his very nature he calls from it. God can do everything, but there's one thing that is impossible with God. And that one thing is that God cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. Because God is love, and his very nature he calls from evil. And so when God promises, when God promises, you are guaranteed that he will fulfill whatever God has promised. In this way, God has a debt to fulfill. God is indebted to each and every word and promise that he has promised us in this way. And you and I, by faith, can hold on to the promises of God. And hold on to the promises of God. Because God cannot lie. It is a promise in Revelation 3 and 20. Behold, I stand at the door. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. God has promised. God has promised. And when God has promised, you are guaranteed that he will fulfill his promise. And so you and me are sitting today. And I'm, I'm not sitting on top of a lamp and pointing at you and saying, you, you, you need to come to God because we are in this thing together. I have to be saved by God and you have to be saved by God. I have to pray and you have to pray. We are in this thing together, my brothers and sisters. The devil is not our friend. Sin is not a toy that we can play with. And so, this message is a message of love. But at the same time, it is a warning, my brothers and sisters. Christ is saying in Isaiah 1 verse 18, Come! Let us reason together. Let us reason together. Even though your sins are like scarlet, even though they are red like crimson, I will make them 
as white as wool. I will make them as snow, as white as snow. Now, there are many things in your life that are holding you back from giving your life all oh, I need to God. You are sitting here looking at me. Many of you are given to alcohol. Many of you are given to drugs. Many of you are given to cigarette smoking. Many of these things that are in our lives, that the devil has put in our lives to hinder us from coming to give our lives wholeheartedly to God. Christ is saying, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But not only that, but also to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so when God created the human body, he says that in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, God formed men from the dust of the ground. And when God formed the human body from the dust of the ground, there was the lifeless body of Adam. And when the lifeless body of Adam was there, I say lifeless because he was not a dead body, because death was not known. He was not dead, but he was created lifeless. And then God put many different organs into the human body. And Adam was created and made in the likeness of God, in the very image of God. So if God has ears, Adam had ears. If God has good eyes, Adam had eyes. If God has good hands, Adam has good hands. And everything that God was putting in the, in the human body, he was putting, we were so meticulously organized. And so, we find that there's one thing that God did as he was creating Adam. He put a very special organ. There was a special organ that God put in the lifeless body of Adam at creation. And that organ is called the human brain. Now, this human brain that was placed in the body of Adam is the control center of the entire human body. All our five senses, the sense of seeing, touch, feel, all of these five senses, all of them are controlled by this wonderful, marvelously created organ called the human brain. Now, the devil knowing that God created the human being and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And the control center of that human body was the human brain. The devil knew that the only way you could get into the, the corrupting this new creature was to go and corrupt the control center. And so the frontal law is where God speaks to you and me through the Holy Spirit. And so the devil invented all these things, drugs, alcohol, that when you take them in, they benumb the consciences so that you do not understand and you are not able to make a conscious decision with a clear mind. And when the devil does that, he gains you and he can use you to do whatever he wants. He can get you to commit adultery. He can get you to get pornography, to do all these filthy things in the eyes of God. Because when he gets control of the frontal law, he controls the human body. So, I'm saying this morning, many of these things, like taking alcohol and drugs, you have given them an opportunity in your life. You have even given an opportunity in your life for cigarettes. You, you have said to yourself, I want to try cigarettes. I want to try these drugs. I want to try this alcohol. I want to try sex. I want to try this. You have tried all these things in your life. But Christ is saying today, come to me, all that labor and are happy life. I will give you rest. If in your life you could give opportunity for a cigarette to be smoked. When God created the human body, he created the respiratory system. Now the respiratory system is designed in such a way that it can only take in oxygen. When you look outside, you see green plants. God first created the vegetation that bring out oxygen. And our respiratory system is designed in such a way that it can only take in oxygen. Now when we breathe in oxygen, the oxygen goes into a wonderful organ called the lungs. When the oxygen goes into the lungs, our body is made out of blood. Most of our body is just blood. And the blood that has been used up by our body, which is now dead, or which is called deoxygenated blood, it moves back to the heart, another special organ. And when it goes into the heart, the heart is always pumping. And if you do that to your chest, you will find that the heart is pumping all the time. If it stops pumping, you are dead. And so the blood that 
is dead, the deoxygenated blood comes in to the heart. And when it comes into the heart, the heart will push it into the lungs. And what do you find in the lungs? The oxygen that we breathe in. And so when it goes into the lungs, it becomes revitalized and energized again and oxygenated so that it can perform its duty. And when the blood has got the life, it goes back to another ventricle and it's pushed to the rest of the body so that you can become alive again and live. That is how God created us. Now, when you take in a cigarette and you smoke and you put a combustion of nicotine and tar and all these filthy things that the devil has invented into your respiratory system, then uh, there's combustion, you're coughing and bronchitis and cancer. And there's all these things. And the devil is self-destructing you. He's using these things to destroy you, to destroy the temple that God has given you. So, you have given that an opportunity in your life before a secret. Alcohol. You have given these things an opportunity. Christ is saying, if you have given those things before an opportunity in your life, why don't you try me today? Because these things have not satisfied you. All they have done is they have killed you. You are all sick because of these things. And sin has infested all of us. And so, Christ is saying today, if you can give such filthy things, such filthy habits, a chance in your life, why don't you try me today, my brother? Why don't you try me today, my sister? He's appealing to the conscience. He's saying, come, let us reason together. Let us reason together. Even if your sins are as scarlet, are as red as scarlet, I will make them as white as snow, my son. God loves us with an everlasting love. God is saying, come unto me. Come. Is that cigarette going to hinder you from everlasting life that I want to give you for free? God does not have a beginning and he does not have an ending. And he's saying, come. Leave that alcohol. Leave that womanizing. Leave that hatred. Leave that life of sin. Come, let me give you a new heart. Come, I'll take away that heart of stone it says in Ezekiel. And I'll create a new heart within you. I will renew your spirit. And he says, I will cause you to walk in my statue, and in my judgment. And you will do as I please. And it is God that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He said, if you can give still the habits like monogram and masturbation and all these things that smoking and taking alcohol, if you can give them an opportunity in your life, why can't you come today and give me a chance also? What is it that is holding you back from trying Christ? If you could try a drug, if you could try dick and all these funny drugs like marijuana and all these things, if you could try those filthy habits that self-destruct, if you can take an alcohol, why don't you also want to just try him today? He's saying, come, I am the door. It's a radical statement. By me, if any man enter it, shall be saved. The invitation is to the entire human race. So this gospel, the good news, that all said you and I were sinners. Christ came nonetheless to die for our sins so that we can have this second chance in life. It shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations. Like it is being preached this morning in this very period. And not one person seated in this period who will say on that great day when Christ shall appear in the clouds of heaven with all his splendor that I did not know of this gospel. Not one person seated in this very area who say, I did not know that there was a savior who came to die the death that I was supposed to die. I did not know that there was such good news. I did not know that God had so much love that he came to die the death that I was supposed to die just so that I could have life if I choose to. So, God is a God of love. His nature is love. His character is love. He does not take any pleasure in a false obedience, but to all intelligent beings that he has created, he grants them freedom of will, freedom of choice, that they may render him voluntary service out of their own appreciation of the love that he has shown in that while then we were sinners, Christ came to die for us. So, the old ship of Zion is sailing in this carriage this morning, and Christ himself is the captain of the ship. You are stuck on this planet and you are stuck on this island infested by sin. And Christ is sailing 
is the captain of the old ship of Zion this morning. And he's saying, as he sees you from afar, from a distance, and the ship is approaching, and it has arrived now, this morning, this gospel has arrived in your very own ears. Even though you are not a Christian, even though you don't go to a church, but the gospel has followed you on the train. Because Christ said so. Because Christ said it will happen. Now the old ship of Zion, my brother, the Christ that we are worshipping today is the son of the living God. He's saying, come to me. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, shall be saved. The old ship of Zion is sailing. And Christ himself is the captain. And he's saying, step on board, my brother. Step on board the old ship of Zion. It may never pass this way again. It may never pass this way again in your life. The invitation is a message of love. And it's being extended to the entire human race. To the entire human race. This invitation is coming to you this morning. And I'm challenging you, my brother. And I'm challenging you, my sister. And I'm challenging you, my uncle. If you can give all these other filthy habits in your life, why don't you try to give Christ an opportunity in your life? You can give a cigarette. You can give marijuana. You can give alcohol an opportunity in your life. You can give pornography, with masturbation, filthy habits, a chance in your life. Why? What is stopping you from trying also to just give Christ a chance? Just this once. Just this once Christ is pleading. In Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Christ is knocking at the door of your heart this morning, my brother. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness, which means it will be passing in front of your own very eyes as a witness, as it is this very morning. It will just be passing as a witness. For that great day when Christ shall appear in the cloud of heaven with all his splendor, not one person sitting in this area who will say, I did not know of this good news. So the decision that you are going to make pertaining this gospel will determine where you and I are going to spend eternity, my brother. The decision that you are going to make, my sister, pertaining this gospel will determine where you and I are going to spend eternity. And it's the invitation that I send and, and invite each and every one that is here. You know yourself and you know your life. And I know my life, as I said earlier. And I'm not just sitting on top of a lamp and pointing at you and saying, you, you need to change. But I'm saying, we are in this thing together. We have to pray. You have to pray. I have to pray. So I ask and invite you to accept Christ in your life. And as you go, I pray that the Holy Spirit will be with you and continue to break your consciences. And may you continue to walk with you.